So please give a warm welcome to Anna Godfroy and her talk is called Grassroots Change. Um, so I'm originally from France. I think there's a few French uh, speaker or at least French people in this room. I heard quite a few <laughs> French people, yeah. So, um, um, okay, I do have notes. I know the previous two speakers were like, no notes, but, but my slides are, I'm not going to use the slides very much. I, do, I just have them and it's mostly for, for the images. So I'm going to show you the first one. So this is the Binners Project. Uh, it's an organization that I co-created four years ago, almost five years ago, actually, uh, with a Binner. Uh, so it's somebody that uh, recycles waste, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, so I ha we have a definition here. So it's a person who collects redeemable containers and other things from bins. Uh, and the goal of that is to make a living. Um, um, uh, ooh, I'm clicking uh, inadvertently. So um, we, we created that because, so I'm going to go backward a bit. Uh, so when I came here a few years ago from France, I was in the UK before actually, and um, just like Josh was just mentioning, um, you know, we have poverty in Europe. There's no question about that, but we don't really see binners. We don't really see people pushing a shopping cart and collecting waste, recycling waste. Uh, and I could... I thought that was quite interesting, especially uh, seeing the contrast with the rest of Vancouver, which is extremely clean ext compared to Paris or London. Extremely clean, uh, extreme, extremely tidy. And then there's the downtown east side in the middle, and it's chaos. Like it's, <laughs> right? Like it's a completely different world. Uh, and then there is a lot of people that just have w uh, things that they found from the bins and they either go to the depot and get cash for, for what they got, like the aluminum from the cans or the glass. But they also find objects, uh, things that, uh, that you know, clothes, thing, food, and they sell it on the street um, or they use it for themselves. Um, and so I could see, I mean, I thought that was pretty interesting and obviously uh, helping with uh, recycling waste, diverting waste from landfill, but also uh, helping people make uh, a bit of extra money for, for that. So um, we got together with, um, with a group of people and, and um, we decided to... I mean, okay, so there was no organization at the time that was supporting the binners. There was a bottle depot that had been created, uh, which was amazing, but there wasn't an actual organization to support this group. And um, they told, like, one of the first things they were telling us was, we, we, like, people hate us. <laughs> like, people are just like, you know, if they see us on the street, they will go across the street to walk on the other side, like, that kind of thing. Or, like, we get, like, people fight us. The VPD argue with us because we use shopping carts. Things like that that are like, well, I don't really, I mean, why, would, why do we need to hate that? Like, why can't we support that, in fact, and make it uh, a bit more legitimate? And so we did uh, a lot of consultation. Lots of consultation with people, with binners, uh, and after a few months, we decided to create something. Uh, so I have a um, two-minute video that I'm going to show you that kind of tells you where we're at. My dad was a commercial fisherman, and I started when I was 14. I fished 25 years out there, and then I started having my heart attacks, so I stayed home. I've been down here for 14 years on the east side and about 11 years that I've been binning. I don't know anybody that likes binning. I mean, there's parts of it that are okay, but people look at you differently. When you're pushing a cart down the street, they all look at you like you're kind of a weirdo or you're taking something from somebody. But you do what you gotta do down here to survive. out and make a $40 day, you're going to do okay. But they've locked everything up and that's made it extremely difficult. You're basically dependent on what people set out for you. Some lady looked at me and she said, God bless you. And I went, for what? 
And she said, well, you're recycling all that. And it, you know, it kind of dawned on me, yeah, this isn't going in the garbage. That's why I'm with the Binners Project. What we want to do is take away some of the stigmatisms that are on Binners and say, look, these guys are all out earning a legitimate living and they work hard for it. But the bottom line is to get bottles. So any event going on that there's bottles will be there. We'll show you that we can do it. It won't be no problem. You know, we just recycled 42,000 cans that would have been in the landfill. That's a good feeling. As a group, it's huge. I want people to say, I belong here. Yeah, so that's a video we made a long time ago now, almost three years ago. Um, and so what I was saying earlier, so we consulted with Binners, we met with a lot of them, and what they told us was that uh, maybe, you know, Binning wasn't their dream career, that's not necessarily where they saw themselves being, but that's where they were at at that point. Um, our members, uh, so the Binners that are part of Binners Project, are extreme, like they have, it's a very complex problem. So they are poor, they have serious addiction issues, they have mental health, physical health issues. Um, they, they've been, you know, so many of them have worked in the past, but maybe 15 years, 20 years ago, they don't even know what, like they never used even a smartphone. Like there's such a gap uh, and it's, it's a complex thing. And so someone like Michael, um, as you said in the video, he had, uh, you know, he was a fisherman in the past. He had heart attacks, many, t a few of them actually. One recently, even, uh, he's okay. And um, and so he, he kind of went off work for a long time, and he kind of, you know, he went down and lost everything. And so what he had was going out every day, leaving his place, walking around the neighborhood, find a shopping cart go around the city, same route every day, trap line, that's how they call it. So they just go, he used to go through the bridges, uh, through the Cambridge Bridge, I think, and then Kitsilano, the whole neighborhood, like, like hours and hours of collecting cans and bottles. And then he had informal relationship with uh, residents and local businesses that knew him and knew his face, and they were helping him out by just leaving their cans and bottles outside. Um, and so he did that for many, many years, and um, he was on his own. And also, uh, he was on his own because uh, it's very competitive. Because when you see another binner on the same lane than you, that means you don't get the bottles because the person before you got them. So very isolated as well, and, um, and kind of you know ashamed of being always in the back lane and n nobody really seeing them, seeing him. Or, and so he, he was one of the first uh, person to, to join the group and quite cynically, he didn't have any expectations of uh, what we would do, but he was like, you know what, why not, like, let's try. So we met once a month uh, with a bunch of people like, exactly like him and we came up with programs uh, that was based absolutely on, the f on the, what the beginners were asking. And so what they were asking us was, I want to have access to more material. Just like, just help me get more cans, basically. Or help me get uh, valuable stuff like electronic or clothes or anything that I can either use or sell. Um, but he wasn't telling me, like, I want a full-time job, help me get there. Like, no way. Like, this, he's been on welfare for many years. And they, with his, his state of where he is in his life, he could never take a, a work at the bank. Or <laughs> so it was really like for the organization or for the Binance project to meet him where he was as opposed to asking him to come to our standard of success, which is all oh, you should work formally nine to five, you know, kind of thing. Um, and that really, I think for, for me, it was interesting because um, I grew up in Lyon in France and uh, I always saw myself as socialist. I remember going on the street, you know, when the government wanted to change the labor laws and they were like, we, we, like, we don't want 
like we were f when I was going on the street, like yeah, 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 against against Sarkozy, the president at the time. Uh, it was always about we want more security in our job. We want things to be more formal, and and now working with people like Michael. I'm realizing actually for a lot of people what they want is flexibility in their work. They want freedom. They want to work when they can. Uh, they want to be able to, they don't, they, don't, they don't want that rigid because they can't, because they have, they have health issues. They need to check in with their doctor like three times a week or blah, blah, blah. So uh, anyway, that was a side thing that I thought was interesting. Um, so anyway, the programs we came up with were based on um, what uh, potential partner could could want, and so event organizers, uh, they produce so much waste in the summer, like you know, Catalano Street Party, Car Free Day. Um, what are the other ones? Uh, at the time, that was FIFA. The video is like the FIFA, like the soccer uh, thing. Uh, they produce so much waste, and because the city of Vancouver is is fairly green, they pressuring those uh, organizers to reduce their waste, and so. We, they, they, the city actually helped us introducing to event organizers, and we were like, okay, we, like, we have this group of people that know how to sort waste. I don't know what they're doing, like a smoothie or something. <laughs> Can I have some? Um, so, okay, it's over. I will have an extra minute for that. Um, and so, yeah, so event organizers and the city of Vancouver wanted uh, help in decreasing their waste. And we were like, look, we have at the time, I don't know, 50 members, 50 winners that all they do all day long is go through the trash and sort. So sort waste. So why don't we put them together? And so that's what we did. We started getting contracts. Um, with all the events I mentioned, of course. Um, and since then, it's crazy. Like, it's, oh uh, yeah, I have that somewhere. And then we, so we, that's the meeting. So we meet once a week with winners. Uh, currently, we have about 50 people showing up every Tuesday for this meeting. Uh, but then overall, we have 150 members, maybe. Like, active members, but we reach out to 350 winners every year. Um, pickups that's more like, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, some businesses that just want to have a relationship with their local winner. So we help them in that. We give them an outfit, like a green, uh, I don't know if I have it somewhere. They have the green t-shirt, the hat, business cards with their name on it. And it's really to look clean, look professional, so the business is not dealing with them as if, as if they were like peasants, but <laughs> instead. <laughs> I don't know, but instead it's like, no, actually I have a skill and I can sort waste and uh, you can hire me for that or you can give me all your bottles. And so, the, yeah, the impact we have is here. So just uh, we just got the numbers from 2018. Uh, we gave $173,000 to the winners uh, and that's like literally money that came from the event organizers and the building managers that hire us and went straight to the winners. Um, our annual budget is bigger than that, and, but that's literally what went into the, binner, the pocket of the binner. So I'm very proud of this number. Um, and then this, I don't know if it's very, but... Um, so the, the sorting program is very similar to the event program. It's basically uh, sorting waste in buildings exactly like this one. So we'd have somebody, like two binners, three binners, coming every day here or once a week and go through all the waste and the goal is to have zero waste at the end. So we do that for convention center. Like we have, we're getting bigger contracts. We do that with uh, the aquarium. Right now we're testing uh, with the Vancouver Aquarium. We have the convention center. We have a uh, PE, and Capilano Suspension Bridge. So lots of, like SFU as well. We're al always looking for more places to do that. Uh, but to give you um, um, a norm, like a, an idea of the Waste diversion that we do is. Um, I need to check the time. Five minutes. Um, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we do is uh, so they, they everything. So, to give you an example, Capilano Suspension Bridge, 
uh, they have visitors, you know, coming from everywhere in the world. Uh, nobody can sort because you don't sort the same way in Japan than in Westminster than in wherever you're from. And even between Westminster, uh, is this, no, oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> New Westminster, sorry. <laughs> New Westminster, Coquitlam, like, and even here, the sorting is completely different. Like some soft plastics are being recycled, other ones don't. So you need the skills to do that. And so the binners do that. And so Capilano had 100% of their waste going to landfill before. Don't tell them I'm sharing this. And now, since they hired us, 97% of the waste is being recycled. Right? So that's Capilano, but can you imagine convention center? Like we're there every day, eight hours a day. We have two binners every day there. They, they rotate. It's not always the same people. <laughs> but you can imagine like how much diversion that means. And so it's so our impact is really more. I have much more to say, but I'm not going to. Um, the <laughs> I think it's more. It's more to say our impact is much more than. Um, numbers and you know of, it's it's environmental we recycle waste we help binners to um, find you know a community or we organize that uh, community they connect they meet every tuesday night they meet they meet each other they work together um, and then of course there is the yeah so it's economic environmental and social impact together so I'm very proud of that um I'm not done yet <laughs> Uh, and so, just to close, um, as I have a bit more than three minutes left, uh, so I wrote down three questions that often comes back, and that's something uh, you know, focusing on tonight and social cha like change. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about social change mostly because that's what I know. Uh, three questions that always come back is people are always saying, "How can I create change? How to create change?" Like. As Josh was saying earlier, opening the night, it's like we see so many bad news, so much stuff on the news. Like, what can I do? You know, I have a full someone like most people a full-time job. I can't, you know, create something. Uh, the second question is uh, which issue to tackle. So there's so many issues. How do you pick which one to tackle? I'm going to answer them. And the third one is where to start. Uh, it's okay. Let's say I know what I want to do, but where to start? So my answers. Uh, in case you want to know. Uh, based on my humble experience after doing this for five years, and before that I had no experience uh, running anything like that. Um, how to create change? My answer is you don't create change. When you're talking about social impact, you help the people that are victim or that are, are dealing with the issues to create change. So we, it's not like I came to the binners and I was like, I'm going to get you out of the dumpsters and I'm going to help you, blah, blah, blah. No, like it's because it's, it's, it's the wrong approach. Change comes from the, you know, like the, the community. And so for me, um, really, if you're trying to work with people with addiction, you need to talk to them. Like, they know more than anyone else how to get out of that, uh, if, even if they can get out of it. Maybe it's more about managing their addiction than getting them out of their addiction. So, uh, and poverty is a very big systemic problem that um, you, can't, you can't work on all aspects of poverty, which is why uh, my next question was which issue to tackle. I would say, from my experience again, I think it's important to pick one. And then hopefully you can make bridges between issues. So for me personally, my thing was my initially it was more the social impact. Like I could see people being um, stigmatized for what they did, and so that's what you know got me into that. But really, in fact, now I'm seeing it's a domino effect because again we're doing economic dev local economic development, environmental. So I see like I really think when you approach one problem and you become good at it and you become an expert in that, I think you can make the bridges and tackle more issues. And then the last um, thing where to start, um, and it kind of loops back into the first question, is 
Uh, I think really volunteering is very important. I think uh, before creating the Binance project, I volunteered for a, lo a long time with many different organizations, and it's really, again, not coming with my own solution, but learning what's already in place and working with the organizations that are already there, and then maybe filling those gaps. Uh, I think it's so, I think, you know, like younger generation, we, we tend to, we want the credit, right? We want to create new stuff, we want to reinvent the wheel, but really, in fact, a lot of things are already happening, and they're happening in the community. Uh, the local, the uh, recycling and local economic development is actually happening in the on the streets in the downtown east side. People are selling on the street, and that's the answer for them to their poverty issue. And it's by selling extra, making extra cash. And, and so, uh, yeah. Anyway, just to say that um, I really believe it's important to listen to the community and the people that are the that are victim of those problems. Uh, I think I exceeded my time. Yes, uh, by 57 seconds. Thank you.